in the desert, and in the midst of that desolation stand ambitious men. Long ago, Nimrod, a mighty warrior and king of the desert, desired a place as a god. So he said to his people, come, let us make a name for ourselves and build a tower, lest we be dispersed and forgotten. So they began construction on a spire that would prick the heavens. Then the Lord descended in radiant theophany, twisting their tongues in his displeasure. Men who had once been allies were torn apart by the confusion of their languages and dispersed throughout the wasteland. Thus the place was called Babel, and its ruins still lie in the plains of Shinar, populated only by the owls and hyenas. Nimrod's nation was scattered, but his vision lingers on, gnawing at the imagination of generation after generation. Constantly, his children roam, splintering according to language and culture, coalescing and then fracturing again. They build ceaselessly, but leave behind only a trail of crumbling monoliths beneath the cold light of the moon. After a time, the Lord sent his son to pave the way through the desert to the holy city of Zion. He adopted countless descendants of Nimrod and gave them a mighty gift. The very spirit that had first confused language would now give men one voice and a word to speak. Nimrod's offspring still apply all their might to building towers of steel and glass, but the children of the Lord live in the sand, making their slow pilgrimage along the way and singing of Zion. Their chorus is the unified voice of the faithful, proclaiming, No eye has seen, no mind has conceived the full glory of Zion, but in everything are signs and signifiers. These events shape everything that is to follow. interested in this state of confused language and how we construct interpretations. Language and the Infinite is a brief lecture which is heavily indebted to the first section of Umberto Eco's interpretation and over-interpretation. While staying within the one language I know, which happens to be English, the challenges of interpretation are dizzying. There are a multitude of models for navigating the complex series of relationships between author, text, reader, and the countless other factors involved in the transmission of knowledge and information. 
The two extreme poles in this discussion are to elevate the intention of the author as the ultimate authority, or to consider only the reader who, to quote Richard Rorty, beats the text into a shape which will serve his own purpose. This is essentially a problem of meaning and whether it is plural, completely absent, or transcendent. This may appear to be a relatively recent debate stemming from reader-oriented critical theory, but humans have been wrestling with this since ancient times. Echo outlines a surprising number of similarities between postmodern approaches to this dilemma and ancient hermetic and mystical understandings of reality within the Western intellectual tradition. For many of us in the West, our mental architectures are built on the foundation of logic and limits which we inherit from Greek and Roman civilizations. But there's a third aspect of the Greek legacy that lurks in the background. Infinity, that which escapes the norm and has no boundary. This idea develops into the idea of continuous metamorphosis or constant change, which becomes personified by Hermes or Mercury, who's the supposed father of alchemy. Echo looks at the second century after Christ, when the world is a melting pot of races, languages, and religions. All these differences were ostensibly dissolved when the Roman Empire swallowed up their countries, but the practical reality is, of course, much more complicated. How do you apprehend meaning in this multiplicity of religions and cultures? Now it is easier to accept the idea of multiple truths, because when we think of text, they are simply that. But for much of human history, textual interpretation has been an issue of deep, eternal significance. In this space, there are two options. Option one, there is the legend of a caliph who ordered the destruction of the Library of Alexandria, arguing that either books say the same thing as the Quran, in which case they are superfluous, or they say something different, in which case they are wrong and harmful. He possessed the truth and knew the intention of the author, and thus judged all books by whether they conformed to this truth. There is only one path through the maze. Option two. Second century Hermeticism is looking for a truth it does not know, and all it possesses are books. Therefore, it imagines or hopes that each book will contain a spark of truth, and they will serve to confirm each other. It is possible for many things to be true at the same time, even if they contradict each other. There are many paths through the maze. Option two creates a problem. What is truth if seeming contradictions can both be labeled true? To resolve this dilemma, one must see each word as an illusion or allegory. There must be a deeper mystery at work outside of our limits, the infinite. If true understanding is contained in fragments and illusions, then it becomes necessary to look beyond human utterances to the divine word. Within mystic traditions, the divine word uses the vehicle of vision, dream, and oracle. Secret knowledge is deep knowledge. Truth becomes identified with what is not said or said obscurely and must be understood beyond or beneath the surface of the text. The hieroglyphic and enigmatic messages of the oracle invite unlimited semiosis. The practical consequence here is that interpretation becomes infinite. And in an attempt to look for a final, unattainable meaning, one begins to accept a never-ending drift or sliding of meaning. This way of looking at the world leads one to a place where every single object on earth or in heaven hides a secret. And every secret one discovers refers to another secret towards a final secret, which we cannot know. Echo says, hermetic thought transforms the whole world into a theater of linguistic phenomena, and at the same time denies language any power of communication. The hermetic model gives birth to its own adversary. Alchemy becomes modern scientific rationalism, and eventually rationalism triumphs. But the hermetic tradition continues to lurk in the background. In fact, it is impossible to separate it from the history of many Western scientists. It influenced Francis Bacon, Copernicus, Kepler, and Isaac Newton, to name a few. This is possible because the Hermetic model suggests the idea that the order of the universe described by Greek rationalism could be subverted, and that it was possible to discover infinite new connections and new relationships in the universe. 
many poets and philosophers that have led us to postmodern concepts of criticism and textual understanding were also influenced by hermetic irrationalism, including Goethe, Yeats, Heidegger, and Young. Paul Valery said, there is no true sense of a text. This is the hermetic idea that a text is an open-ended universe where the interpreter can discover infinite interconnections because language is unable to grasp a unique and pre-existing meaning. This is to see the world as a tissue of quotations like Barst describes in The Death of the Author. The return to an infinite understanding of textual interpretations means that, as Echo says, to salvage the text, that is, to transform it from an illusion of meaning to the awareness that meaning is infinite, the reader must suspect that every line of it conceals another secret meaning. Words, instead of saying, hide the untold, the glory of the reader is to discover that text can say everything except what their author wanted it. As soon as a pretended meaning is allegedly discovered, we are sure that it is not the real one. The real one is the further one, and so on and so forth. The losers are those who end the process by saying, I understood. Into this space it becomes interesting to consider Robert Smithson's remark. In the illusory babbles of language, an artist might advance specifically to get lost and to intoxicate himself in dizzying syntaxes, seeking odd intersections of meaning, strange corridors of history, unexpected echoes, unknown humors, or voids of knowledge. But this quest is risky, full of bottomless fictions and endless architectures and counter-architectures. At the end, if there is an end, are perhaps only meaningless reverberations. Here, language covers, rather than discovers, its sites and situations. Here, language closes, rather than discloses, doors to utilitarian interpretations and explanations. The language of the artists and critics referred to in this article become paradigmatic reflections in a looking glass novel <coughs> that is fabricated, according to Pascal's remark, nature is an infinite sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. The entire article may be viewed as a variation on that much misused remark or as a monstrous museum constructed out of multifaceted surfaces that refer not to one subject, but to many subjects within a single building. A brick equals a word, a sentence, a room, a paragraph, a floor of rooms, and so on. Or, language becomes an infinite museum whose center is everywhere and whose limits Our text today comes from Elia and Amelia Kabakov's Palace of Projects. They say, but we are convinced, and will try to demonstrate this in our installation, that the only way and means to lead a worthy human life is to have one's own project, to conceive it and bring it to its realization. To have one's own project, to realize it, perhaps, should be inherent in every person. The project is the concentration, the embodiment of the meaning of life. Only thanks to it can he establish who he is, what he is capable of, can he receive his birth name. It is only from the moment of the determination of his project that his true existence, and not just survival, begins. How many of you have ever had a project, something with a deadline or something that can at great personal cost, or we had to set every other part of your life aside for a little bit, a thesis show, maybe. Um, if you've ever had the satisfaction of finding a project and seeing it through to the end, you'll have some idea of what the Kavikovs are discussing here. 
Uh, eight of you in this room are very close to experiencing the sublime satisfaction that comes with having a project. And the almost certain, certainly profound anticlimax that inevitably follows from it. And looking at this text, I'd like to examine the problem, the project, and the paradox. So the project, which I like to call, sorry, the problem, which I like to call the Babel problem, is that we all have this desire for a project. <coughs> we need a purpose and a significance to be part of something larger. We don't need work just because we need money to put food on the table. We need a project to lead a fully human life. And the trouble is that not everyone really realizes this, and they fill their lives with empty achievements, whether that's the secondhand success of a sports team or a promotion or being pat on the back by your favorite mentor. Uh, whatever it is, it's treating a symptom and not the root cause. It's just surviving. Additionally, even if you find a way to truly exist, you're still not completely fulfilled. Even if we do manage to find a project, it invariably remains unrealized, unfinished, or unsatisfactory. Human history is littered with these unfinished edifices, both personal and public. This is partly because humanity is dispersed and fragmented and tribal. Rather than the human race, we have warring communities cannot unify for either ultimate good or ultimate harm, fortunately. Uh, even if we can find our project, it is more often than not used in service against someone else's project or some other tribe or group. So if it's necessary, though, for us to find a project, we should discuss what that is. They say it's the concentration, the embodiment of the meaning of life. Now that's a bold claim, and one that I think is perhaps slightly hyperbolic. The project doesn't need to be grand in the traditional sense. It doesn't, for example, need to be like the alchemist's search or the philosopher's stone or the totality or anything like that. It could be something simple like the commitment to a zero-waste lifestyle or the pursuit of uh, political office and the power to affect change. Uh, it could be the creation of a hyper icon or the writing of a novel or the starting of a company but it has to align with one's personal values and acquire some kind of significance to become your project. Uh, it's also possible that you can acquire multiple projects over the course of your life. <coughs> it's helpful also to understand the paratext surrounding this quote. The Palace of Projects was an installation that was originally conceived in 1998 for Roundhouse, which is an art space in London. Uh, it mimicked the building structure and was placed perfectly in a central row of columns. Um, it's made of uh, fabric, wood, and steel, and it kind of creates a spiral that flows from within. Uh, it resembles the Roundhouse building as well as Tatlin's monument to the Third International. Um, and as visitors walk through the palace, they see uh, 65 individual projects that are an archive of utopian ideas and stories told by fictional Soviet citizens. These projects include maquettes, paintings, and writings that propose remedies for the challenges of daily life and suggestions for personal growth and improvement. Amelia once said about their work, his world and work are based and built on fantasy and the history of art. I, on the other hand, very early in life, somehow learned to combine both reality and fantasy, and to live in both. My fantasy world is always close to and coexists with reality. Our life is very much based on this combination. I am trying to make reality <coughs> seem like the realization of a fantasy, or maybe a, a continuation of a fantasy. But there is no place for real, everyday situations and problems. Our life consists of our work, dreams, and discussions. So the application here is go find your project. Be utopian, think about tomorrow or the beyond. Don't be content to simply survive. Find a project, devote your time to it, and you'll find that it's time well spent. As Amelia says, life is at the intersection of fantasy and reality. Channel your dreams and utopian hopes into this reality. Bring them into discussion through your project and make the world.
this might be a good time to take a short break and actually talk about my work for a minute. <laughs> so the panels, the bookshelf, the accompanying text, this talk, any discussions that we might have had, I see all of that as one thing. Um, I refer to that one thing as the edifice. Uh, and that edifice is a hyper icon. Uh, a hyper icon is a tool that philosophers and artists sometimes use uh, as a way to explore uh, complex and multifaceted ideas. So you've seen these before. Um, Plato's Cave would be a good example. Um, Deleuze and Guattari's Rhizome would be a hyper icon. Uh, William Blake's Jerusalem is <coughs> kind of long epic poem becomes a kind of hyper icon. Uh, the alchemist's uh, magnum opus becomes another type of hyper icon. Um, so it's this idea that you, you can't just explain it needs this image uh, to, to engage with. Um, so it's this concept that I'm eager to share, but I can't find the language for except by this kind of rather hermetic project that I've embarked on. Uh, the nearest that I can come to conveying the idea that I'm interested in is to say that this hyper icon is a sort of metaphor for the mental architectures that we've built up over the centuries. We all have a mental architecture. I don't think we construct these without aid, though. We inherit, adopt, co-opt all these components, and then we renovate and elaborate on, on them as we move through life. So politics, jokes, art, um, experiences all resonate with us because they have a certain aesthetic quality that aligns with the mental structure. Um, most of the time, as you move through life, you have these sensory, intellectual, or spiritual experiences. And if they fit within the scaffolding that you already have, they kind of add to that edifice. They provide decoration or breadth or support. Um, sometimes you call that confirmation bias. But if they don't fit within that edifice, most of the time, they bounce off of these impenetrable walls. Uh, I call this way of understanding human cognitive behavior edificial epistemologies which is the title of the, the piece, of the wall piece, in Gateway. Um, and it's the ways that humanity has constructed knowledge and its search for truth and transcendence. So this project is a way for me to explore the ideologies that shape my own edifice. Um, and it's something I, I can't see the whole. I can only see these parts, this kind of shadowy outline. And so I've been externalizing my research and speculation from the last seven years uh, into the structure, into this talk, into the, the bookshelf, the writing that goes with it. Um, and this becomes a kind of archive that generates further discussion and further questions. So while constructing uh, the hyper icon, I use this modular construction that you can see here. Uh, a modular approach made sense both conceptually and practically. You know, I had to fit in my car. It's all this fits in the backseat. Uh, so very practical, but I also wanted this idea of a very, very large structure that was made out of these predetermined elements, uh, which is the scale, which I'll talk about in a second. And then those elements make up a grid. Uh, I knew that I liked the grid when I got here. That was a very defining aspect of my work, even early on. Um, but when I read Rosalind Krauss's essay on the grid, like really cemented this idea that this is a tool that's going to become very important to me. Um, and I was particularly struck by the way that she talks about its ability to represent or suggest both the material and the mystical, that both of those things are present when you use the grid. Um, and you notice, of course, it's not a perfect grid. Um, my project is ordered, but there's kind of multiple systems of order going on here. And there's kind of different contingencies being used. So it's Something that can be added to, removed from, can be assembled in different ways in different spaces. Uh, but all of that is made with this two by one element. So most of them are two by one feet. Uh, there's some smaller two by one panels and then one larger, but still two by one ratio. So I chose that. Um, there are several artists I really respect that start with a pre-existing scale or dimension, R.H. Quakeman comes to mind. Comes to mind. Um, and some people find that really limit limiting. I find that really freeing to kind of have this set of building blocks that I can then manipulate and play with. Um, and I chose the two by one ratio because I found it kind of vaguely evocative of bricks, which I liked. 
Um, it fit my desire for a vertical composition. Um, and it kind of becomes my ascendant rectangle that I use. Uh, the idea has always been more interesting to me than the actual material. So I kind of start with these ideas and I use whatever I have on hand or that I can get convenient access to to manifest those ideas. So my investigations of things I'm interested in span from ancient cosmologies to speculative fiction, particularly science fiction, uh, from medieval alchemy to the kind of inherent spiritualism of the early uh, non-representational or non-objective arts of modernism, uh, cathedral facades to postmodern architecture. Um, all of these are kind of the mental materials that are layered into that construction that you saw in Gateway. Uh, and then the Tower of Babel, of course, is a key starting point. Um, pretty much all of the ideas that I'm interested in are contained in this narrative of the Tower of Babel. Um, and those two by one plywood panels kind of become the building blocks that I use to build this, this edifice. And then the bookshelf, which seemed like some people saw and some people didn't. But that was also part of my work. So that's made with the same panels that the, the wall piece is made of and is the same uh, ratio as uh, the larger panel on the right, that four by two feet. So it kind of corresponds in size and materials. One of my uh, favorite things to do when I go visit someone's house or studio is go snoop at their bookshelf, because I feel like that's a really good way to um, get to know them a little better uh, without the uh, annoyance of talking to them, or the uncomfortableness <laughs> of talking to them, the awkwardness of social interaction. Um, but it gives you this idea of their, their background, what they like, what kind of things that, that their work is about. Um, so by including my own reading list with the help from the Decker Library, uh, I wanted to create another layer of references to kind of go along with the references made within the panels. Um, so it, it adds points of connection for the viewer, and it also kind of gives an idea of the trajectory or trajectories that I'm interested in. Uh, when the viewer can say, oh yeah, I read that. Okay, well, well what, what's the connection between that book and what's up there? And even if they haven't read the books, just seeing all those titles together kind of creates another type of mental edifice in whatever viewer is, is reading it. So it's kind of a, almost like an experiment in a more open type of artist statement to go along with, with the work. I wanted to end my talk uh, with an invisible city, an imaginary city, uh, described by Italo Calvino in his book, Invisible Cities. Uh, this particular city is called Eudoxia, and I found it really compelling uh, in conjunction with, with my own project. Really short, I'll just read it to wrap up. In Eudoxia, which spreads both upward and down, with winding alleys, steps, dead ends, hovels, a carpet is preserved in which you can observe the city's true form. At first sight, nothing seems to resemble Eudoxia less than the design of that carpet. <coughs> and symmetrical motifs whose patterns are repeated along straight and circular lines, interwoven with brilliantly colored spires, and a repetition that can be followed throughout the whole book. But if you pause and examine it carefully, you become convinced that each place in the carpet corresponds to a place in the city, and all the things contained in the city are included in the design, arranged according to their true relationship, which escapes your eye, distracted by the bustle, the throngs, the shoving. 
All of Eudoxia's confusion, the mule's brain, the lamp black stains, the fish smell, is what is evident in the incomplete perspective you grasp. But the carpet proves that there is a point from which the city shows its true proportions, the geometrical scheme implicit in its every tiniest detail. It is easy to get lost in Eudoxia, but when you concentrate and stare at the carpet, you recognize the street you were seeking in a crimson or indigo or magenta thread, which, in a wide loop, brings you to the purple enclosure that is your real destination. Every inhabitant of Eudoxia compares the carpet's immobile order with his own image of the city, an anguish of his own, and each can find concealed among the arabesque an answer, the story of his life, and the twist of fate. An oracle was questioned about the mysterious bond between two objects so dissimilar as the carpet and the city. One of the two objects, the oracle replied, has the form the gods gave the starry sky and the orbits in which the worlds revolve. The other is an approximate reflection, like every human creation. For some time, the augurs had been sure that the carpet's harmonious pattern was of divine origin. The oracle was interpreted in this sense, arousing no controversy. But you could, similarly, come to the opposite conclusion that the true map of the universe is the city of Eudoxia, just as it is, a stain that spreads out shapelessly with crooked streets, houses that crumble one upon the other amid clouds of dust, fires, screams, and the darkness. So through all this, I'm left with more questions than answers, but perhaps I can answer some of your questions. <laughs> So do I think over time it can become, arrive at a state of more completion? Like get to the point where I feel like this is done or I understand? In your view, yeah. In my view. No. <coughs> yeah. I, I think it's the tension between that's what I really want and then the knowledge that that is impossible, that there's all, like the more you know, the less you know kind of thing. Um, so I, I think it, it's more about like the search and the effort to build that. But every time a new element is added, you kind of, it shifts or, yeah. Um, so you quote the Tabakov as uh, the quote about the project and that's every human needing this project. Mm -hmm. um, and then you connect that project to the sense of knowledge and the history of different cultures are you implying that any all projects need to have the metaphor of the edifice? No, I, I think for me that's an image that makes everything kind of make sense. Like that's the or not everything makes sense, but that's kind of the the image that I filter the world through. So like. Um, I use the example of the rise of, like, for some people, that's their image, and everything's kind of connected to that. So I think people have these sort of different mental models, and for me, architecture is just kind of the most compelling image to use. And it, that, can, that makes sense of the impulse that I see in myself and, are, and around me and throughout history. Uh, yes? Um, I mean, interesting. 
interested in this idea that the, the work of art is not just like the, the blocks on the wall, but the talk as well, and like the presentation of it. And I guess I'm wondering, the, the work has a title, right? So like, what, what is the title delineating? Like, where does it end, I guess? Yeah, so the question is about the, the title, and what is that delineating if all of this is the work of art? <coughs> Yeah, I kind of went back and forth on that title and whether it was the right title and how to go about that. Um, I did not title the bookshelf. Like, I saw those as one thing. Um, so there's not like a title for the wall piece and the bookshelf piece. Um, I think, honestly, part of giving it a title was just the reflex of it, something on the wall, so it, so it needs a title. Um, that's a good point. Uh, when you were presenting, you went from uh, standing to going to the higher stool, and then you went to the chair. Mm -hmm. Is this descending trajectory something you thought about in relation with the ascending pyramid, or it's just random? That's a cool observation. I was not thinking about the kind of descending <laughs> level of my, of my talk, but more about like the kind of placement and the kind of different speech patterns and frameworks that different talks are given in, in different places. Okay. But that, that is interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm curious about the, um, you talked about like the sources for um, your like the inherited um, and remodeled mental architectures. Mm -hmm. And I was curious about the era of the aesthetics of learning that you're using. Like um, you're using colors and like the chalkboard and like materials echo and even the, the, the building of the bookshelf, they're not like um, like a IKEA, they're not a today aesthetic right. of knowledge learning. And so I'm curious about um, what your thoughts are on that inheritance and the, the aesthetics yeah. of that. Yeah, that's a good question. Why not? But why is so much of the work and the devices of the talk not from today, or not as contemporary? Um, the blackboard was a very practical thing. I was going to use the whiteboard, and then it broke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure those of you in that classroom are aware that that's broken. Okay. Um, yeah, so that was a last minute change. Uh, that's why, why I chose that. Um, as far as like the work itself, or the, um, like the bookshelf specifically mentioned, I think it was less to do with like kind of intentionally picking tools from another era and more that idea of like what is simple, what is at hand, what do I have access to. Um, so I wanted to use plywood because it was stable and then also just the connection to construction um, and a kind of basic building material. Um, you know, the bookshelf, I just wanted to make it so that it made that connection clear. Um, I have avoided any kind of like technology or involved processes relying on technology um, for various reasons. Uh, I think what I like about what this does without that is that it, I see drawing as thinking, like drawing is the most expedient connection between your mind and your hand. And so by keeping it kind of in that realm, if my idea is to explore concepts and the idea of making an idea manifest, <coughs> that that simplicity is just, at this point, a tool or an effort to do that. Yeah. Um, in the beginning of this one, you had what felt like a sermon, um, and you talked about the Tower of Babel, and essentially, and maybe I'm getting this wrong, is that that upset God, and, and he sent those people on their way, right? Because, I'm guessing, or I think, they were they were trying to live a little too grand to try and pierce the sky there. Um, but then that's what you're doing, right? Yeah. So at what point are you flying too close to the sun? <laughs> <laughs> that's an excellent question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Within this project, I'm kind of interpreting, interpreting all of these kind of points of history through this idea of sort of the continuation of this Babylon impulse that we're like building up. And this is whether that's personal or collectively as a society. Um, 
and for me, it's another example of that tension where it's like, I want to do that, and then I have this kind of personal belief that like that isn't enough, like it's not satisfactory. I'm going to finish this talk and all this work, and I'm going to go look at that and just be really disappointed. And, like, it's this unfulfilling kind of empty pursuit that is also deeply human and important. And yeah, I don't. That's a tension for me. Yeah. My mom is kind of like, this is really good. He's trying to pierce the sky. But um, for me, it functions the opposite way. And you kind of notice this. And you kind of um, repeated this a little bit in your, in your talk, like the idea of beating, beating um, the text into submission or creating stuff either aligned inside of you or it's impenetrable. So it almost feels like you're adopting things and that they either kind of fit inside this architecture. I'm curious, um, what do you think exists outside the maze or outside the city? Or, or do any of these things point to that? Or do they all point kind of into this mental architecture? And do they adopt them or, or let them go? I think what I'm interested in is like, when I read a book, I have a like, have these presuppositions, and so they're like, I'll read a book, and it's like, I have an underlying thing, so they'll like jump out, like, oh yes, you know, like Robert Smith, said, oh he used the word battle, like this must be interesting, you know, he must be talking about the same thing I'm talking about. So there's like that thing that happens where it's on its confirmation bias is the psychology term, I think. So there's like that thing that happens, but there's also the thing that happens that someone else might read that same book, and we'll discuss it, and we're we're seeing very different things. So like. This is kind of built up with these elements that I've drawn from, and then someone else will see it, and it will connect to their own mental framework in a very different way. Um, but I'm asking about your framework and whether or not things have to function inside of it. Like, do you ever think about working on the outside of the edge of your framework, or what happens when an idea doesn't fit in? I think. When an idea doesn't fit, you either ignore it, or reject it, or renovate, or restructure, <coughs> or edit the foundation, which is kind of a painful. But you process. never create a new architecture, or like a whole new whole Yeah, I mean, even this is is a lot different than like the work that I like. I came in with a very clear idea of how my work functioned and what I wanted it to do, and the way that it would be interpreted and understood. And this is this kind of sick, feels to me anyway, like a significant change. So it's, there has been, leading up to this point, a series of kind of tearing down and building up and tearing down. And this just is one moment in that, that process. Uh, Wendy, you had your question. Um, so I really enjoy the two dimensionality of this, and I really love the location you chose for it that it's attached to the wall and it's, it's, it almost can be read like pages of a book. But I am interested if, in knowing if you ever considered um, a more three-dimensional approach, especially because edifice is in the title of this piece and that implies building. Um, yeah. Could you just talk more about that? Yeah, that's a good question and one that I've gotten uh, a lot. Um, I don't know why I have such an aversion to the three-dimensional. Like, I've been kind of encouraged to try that since really ever, it feels like. And I've done, like, kind of, you know, dipping my toe in the water with that. But there's just something about flatness that I really, really like. And, I mean, I've, I've started to do a little bit of, like, this kind of a relief aspect to it. Um, but I think because... It is so much in my head, and it is so much about like reading and interpretation, and that there's something there's something about drawing and putting something as like a when you put a panel on the wall, it becomes this thing to be like this kind of encased ideology that you read or engage with. Um, and so for me, like that's that's done what I'm kind of wanting it to do. Uh, I. In thinking about this and thinking about how it could work in a different space, um, I do kind of like the idea of creating a structure out of these flat panels that, um, like with this one, height kind of creates a, 
an interpretation problem, you know, some of it's too high to really read, uh, which I do like that. And so the idea of, oh, well, like making form do the same thing, like you can't see all in a little bit at once. So I am open to trying that in the future, but it's been something I've avoided very carefully. Uh, yeah. Um, I was just curious about your cho choices of voice through the presentation. Yeah. Um, sort of the sermon where you've memorized it, going to this sort of presentation talk to a sort of what seemed to me like a teaching moment to the artist talk to a very intimate, I'm going to read you a book. Yeah. And if the choice of the sort of pyramid there instead of bullet points was you know, intentional and why. Yeah. And then if within the work in Gateway, if there's any sort of logic to the structure that reflects that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that people, that two people now like see this part as the sermon, because I think of that as the sermon, the kind of, I guess, more like casual sermon, but you know, the three points and they all start to be. Um, this was a like kind of oral retelling of the Tower of Babel, so it's like it is referencing the scripture, I guess, but it's just the story without any kind of textual, you know, exegesis. Whereas that is taking a text and telling um, I guess I picked the kind of formats of knowledge transmission that I am the most drawn to and have shaped me, and that I'm interested in using or playing with. So the Partly just because of the environment that I'm in right now, you know, having an artist talk, having a lecture where you just read it verbatim instead of just giving people a paper to read. Um, story has always been, I, th I think narrative is key to how we as humans form meaning and kind of, I think the foundation part of that building, whatever metaphor you choose, but wherever that starts, my belief is that story is what shapes the scaffolding and everything else kind of sticks to. Um, so that's why I, I kind of wanted to begin and end with a story. Um, I did, uh, you were asking about the, the shape of this. That was to reference kind of the, the form and then kind of the idea. I had a, a pretty elaborate and convoluted like architectural metaphor for what each of these parts were. And you know, this is like the ideological is the foundation. And, building up from there and decided that was too much and kind of an unnecessary layer. But I wanted to kind of evoke that. Uh, and you were, the third part of your question was asking if there was a logic here. Yeah, kind of sort of. This. Yeah, not in a, um, <laughs> I've been talking to you <laughs> um, So not as, as literal as that, uh, I guess. Really, the only thing, or the only correlation as far as the structure would be the very top panel, I would see is deeply connected to the imaginary, but also kind of the joking back. So no, there's not really, a, the logic of that is not dictated by the hierarchy created by that diagram. Yeah, uh, Shane. So in thinking about the fact that there's, I love the word metaphor, because it's been recycled, still struggle with that as a, a hyper icon, um, understanding that. But yeah, so it's really like seven years worth of drawings that have been kind of cut up and layered and uh, reused, uh, partly because this project was almost like, felt like a breakthrough of like, okay, this these are kind of the five threads or kind of the, some of the key ideas that have really been in my work for the last seven years and I've been struggling and struggling to articulate them. Uh, and then the idea, the connection between this and the infinite is think, starting to think of this work as a project rather than a work. So there's, um, you know, I'm not ruining old work and make something that's just like this kind of ongoing thing and I could, you know, give away or lose parts of this, add new parts, 
reconfigure it. Um, so I guess the relation to the infinite is this is kind of in this continued metamorphosis this, this attempt to, to find the structure or find an order that accounts for the universe a little bit better than the last one. Um, and so destroying the old model or absorbing the old model into the new one doesn't bother me in the way that it would have um, can you can you talk about uh, the importance of or um, or the non-importance of negation in the work? Meaning, um, meaning um, the deconstruction of an old model through the through the hierarchical like creation of a new model. Like you're, you're sort of talking about like deconstructing previous modes of knowledge through the through the creation of other modes of knowledge and architecture, like the architecture setting of the blackboard, the architecture setting of the yeah. space. I don't um, see what I'm doing as trying to deconstruct old models so much as like I see when I look back through history and look at these particular areas that I find compelling, yeah. to me I see a similar impulse over time, you know, across cultures, across time. That idea of building towards uh, wanting to attain some kind of truth, transcendence, glory, power, immortality, whatever it is, through building. And whether that's like a literal building of a tall structure, or whether that's through creating a cosmology that puts every part of the universe in order. Yeah. Like, so I'm not trying to like deconstruct those things so much as like find through lines, I guess. Are you critiquing? The, the aspect of forward building, because at one point in the conversation, it almost sounds a little bit like a Steve Jobs commencement speech, like go and build your project, good luck, you need a project to fulfill yeah. your life, and it, it felt very like Silicon Valley, believe in our mysticism tech type thing, yeah. and so are you, are you critiquing the actual building of um, forward ascension and transcendence as a, as a yeah, I mean, I would think that those things are ultimately, like, again, I don't, I don't know how to exactly position myself as a critiquer of those things because it's like, I do the same thing. Yeah. There's something, there's like two sides of the coin. There's the filling aspect of having a project, and you, there is a kind of significance of humanity you gain through that. But at the same time, I think those things are ultimately and did you know that the model changes, the, the structure crumbles, the, the utopian hope eventually fails, but you need to have that, right? And you, the, the way I was sort of thinking it in your project, and I, and I don't know if this is what you were implying, it, but there's this kind of like endless pursuit of perfection. Like you've looked at these older models and have questioned their ability to transcend, and then you've tried to create a transcendent model yourself. And I wonder if what you're really implying is like the idea of unlearning that people are no longer the center of the universe and um, our mind is no longer infinite and um, other things have surpassed us. So I wonder if, and I, and I don't know if that's what you're sort of implying, but this like, idea of transcendence is, is a false myth and it was structured as such that you're almost trying to sell us on it at, yeah. in a very humorous way. So I was like, oh, I, I, I'm not sure I should. Uh, yeah. Yeah. To be honest, I'm not sure how it will work what the work outside of me does in relation to that idea. Uh, personally, I think transcendence through a project is a myth, but I do I do believe that transcendence is possible, and I, I, I do believe humans are of central importance with that. Okay, is there any, and yeah, the reason I was going there is like one way to uh, put it Someone could come and put another part, another partition, or another use the word scaffolding of like an artificial intelligence uh, would far surpass our ability to transcend. Like we are no longer. Well, that's an interesting question. Yeah, because we also use the terminology deep mind, which is uh, I don't know if that was like on AI, so I prefer like deep mind. I don't remember saying that, but I am fascinated by that question, yeah. and I partly because. Just if artificial intelligence could surpass our competence, that's a different question than 
the transcendence. So that is something I'm very interested in, but not something I was necessarily like. When we talk about projects, for me, projects have beginnings and endings, and there's milestones in view. And I think that that's what kind of keeps people going is this notion of I hit a milestone, on to the next one, and there's goals. But when you talk about you know the structure and it's kind of keeps going, it it eludes that idea of the project. Um, so I'm just curious if this. Part, each part was a project, the whole thing was a project, what, what is the project here? Yeah, I, mean, I think you're right as far as how humans like go about projects. Like, as I was working on this, you know, the checkpoint of, I gotta get a panel done, or I've gotta like, finish this before the glue dries, or I'll mess up the whole thing. You know, there's like, there are these like goals that I set myself that kind of creates the next step. But I don't, I, I mean, I think it's, it's just a matter of degree. You could have a project that feasibly went on forever. You know, like your project was, I don't know, making a boat. You know, you figure out, you, you make the boat and you construct it. And you're like, oh, that was so fun. Like, I need to figure out how to do it better. And so you make another, like that kind of becomes this ongoing pursuit of perfection. So I don't, I think within a project there are checkpoints, but whether it's, endless, whether you get bored and stop it, whether you reach a checkpoint and decide that's enough for me, like, there's always the potential for it to continue. Yeah, I mean, when you were talking about the project, and it seemed to me you were talking about, like, people need to find their own passion, their own drive, their own things, um, and, and the project is maybe just the word for that. That's what I was thinking about, and even in religion, it's kind of that's the way that, that I hear that. But that's just yeah. my interpretation of that. Um, but anyway, it's just the use of that word and how it's kind of applied to how you apply to here. I'm just, that's what I'm just curious about. Well, about around projects, I'm curious. Um, I could help with the uh, Bible class when you were talking about projects and the idea of Yeah, the kind of inherent leisure of finding a, a project as a hobby, almost to uh, pursue it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been really interesting hearing Brett's talk, actually, like, again, framing it through my own particular set of interests. But that idea that uh, when work, the, the dignity of labor that, that Brett is pursuing, or the, the, the society should pursue, I kind of see that same thing of like being part of that is part of being human and like having dignity and being able to find purpose and significance in your work and that's what's denied when you create the stratification of class like well your job is to sew this one pocket over and over and over and over versus being part of something uh, larger. I would see that as a big part of the problem of the way that class has been stratified is the kind of Um, you started with the image of the Babel Tower truncated, right? And this idea, it's crumbling. It's, yeah. it's uh, your own in a squash painting that, that, you know, it's full of cracks. Um, and so I, have you eliminated the idea of failure or impossible quest from your edifice? Because Is the it form. there in a different way? Yeah. yeah. I want I mean, the form does not suggest failure, yeah. but is the fact that it's so like layered and it becomes almost impossible, incoherent <coughs> the yeah. abundance of knowledge, is that the futility? Or? Yeah, I definitely, I think because I have an opportunity to do this again, the, the overall composition of it is something I really need to kind of reconsider. Um, for me, yeah, it's the layering, it's the um, the gaps within there, it's the, uh, you know, it's having, 
it's, a, it's having kind of unfinished panels <laughs> off to the side, um, but it, it is this ongoing sort of unfinished thing. Um, so I wanted the, the ziggurat shape because of what that suggested, but I'd like to try installing it in a different configuration that really emphasizes the, the kind of project aspect or the ongoing aspect of it. Um, because this, I feel like, emphasizes the more like aspirational like mm -hmm. aspect of it. But I'd like to try kind of emphasizing different layers. Uh, so I noticed how we can't see the threads in the piece, and we can't see them in the photo, and how you read the story about the rug and the sort of following the thread, and sort of we're talking about five threads, and I don't know. Have you thought about this piece as like the rug, like a map? And if so, like could you place yourself on it? Or? Yeah, um, the threads are just because of documentation not visible. I have other photos that yeah, they're so thin they don't show up in the photo well. Um, yeah, the image of the rug and the idea of trying to like make make a map of the city. When I read that, I was like, I was kind of looking in that book for something that kind of fit with this, and I wasn't expecting to find something that just felt so perfect as a kind of companion to this. Um, I don't know, I guess I would place myself at different points depending on what I was doing. You know, there's like a map of the, or the floor plan of the gallery within there, you know, mm -hmm. at one point thinking about, okay, where is this going to go? Um, you know, the, a lot of those are like sketchbook pages, so wherever I was at that point, there's like all kinds of thoughts kind of just jumbled together on that page. So there's, I can find, you know, it's a map for me in a way that it wouldn't be for anybody else. What if it was for somebody? You want me to use it as a map if you want. I don't think it would get you very far, though. <laughs> <laughs> something I've always been struck by with art, not just my own art, but others' art, is you know, this, the way that you know, dozens or hundreds of hours get distilled into this thing that we kind of, you know, walk by. Sometimes you look at it more, but there's this like, I see that as kind of connected to the, the issue or the problem of interpretation. Like you have all of these ideas and context and framing and effort that goes into something, and then someone else Kind of gets one part of that. They might know, they might really zero in on on the shape that you've created, or one panel, or you know, my mom really loves like one part of it because I use like a flight map from my brother's you know pilot staff. So like for her, it's like oh, it's like so it's just like whatever kind of point of connection that you have, it's just this one like dot in the sea of things. And the same thing like when we look back at history, you know, we might look at, you know, one male artist, white male artist, and there's all this, like, sea of things around that that are just, if, if not more, significant. You know, like, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I'm using that intention, it's just something that is really interesting to me with, with any work of art, how that functions. Were you, were you kind of talking about, like, that, the heaviness of, like, the accumulation of knowledge, like, the, almost like the tyranny of education that could be it's just laden, you know. And yeah, but I think 